works. Um, I rather think the topic today, the importance of quality assurance in the export and supply um, of the Australian wheat industry rather begs the question of what is the importance of quality assurance in export and supply. Um, I wonder whether 10 years ago anyone would have even asked that question. Until two years ago, I don't think I ever knew what um, wheat classification was, and I really didn't think too much about quality assurance. I think we took it rather for granted. Um, it was looked after principally by AWB, who, as the monopoly exporter in this country, had the power and the motivation for managing so many of the aspects of the wheat supply chain that I think we took for granted. The removal of the export monopoly changed the industry forever. It's never going to come back, so we need to cope in a deregulated market. And while many in the industry were very anxious to see the removal of the monopoly and the chance to engage in absolute real competition and improve their own profitability, I think the reality has not been quite so simple. The removal of that exporter removed also many of the industry support services which were managed, developed and um, paid for by AWB. And one of them was wheat classification. Most people in the two years that I've now been in this role, I find actually don't really know what classification is or they didn't. I think quite a few more now know what it is. We know about varieties, we know that. And we know what receivable standards are, although GTA keeps telling us they call them something else now, but we still call them receivable standards, I think you and I. Um, but what's the role of classification in that? And what's the role of the industry now in a deregulated market? Who's going to control quality? AWB used to have knowledge of all of the markets to which they sold wheat. They had knowledge of pretty much the bulk of the Australian crop. They could engage in something called crop shaping. I'm still not certain I understand crop shaping, but I don't think we have it anymore, whatever it was. Um, I think the industry finally, after, when was deregulation, 2008? I think finally, now, we're beginning to see an industry that is asking questions, and I don't think it's asked those questions before. I don't think it's asked them enough, and it's taken an awfully long time to get to this point. The industry's finally asking, um, what is classification? What does quality management mean? Why is it important? What does it deliver? To whom does it deliver it? And how does it do it? Um, and more importantly, how should it do it? As Keith said, Wheat Quality Australia was established just over two years ago. It was established by the Grains R&D Corporation after two years of extensive consultation with all sectors of the supply chain in the wheat industry. Um, the other member of Wheat Quality Australia is Grain Trade Australia. So amongst our two corporate members, we have represented pretty much the whole supply chain. And within our own structure, we ensure that we have the entire supply chain represented. Um, in an industry that is now deregulated and has no overarching big brother to run everything for us so we don't have to worry about it, now everybody has to worry about it. It's the responsibility of the entire chain and everybody in this industry to worry about wheat quality and how that's going to be managed. And the challenges of managing that in a deregulated environment, I can tell you, are significant. Um, we have fierce competition between every sector of the chain and between the participants within each sector, except perhaps at the production end of the chain where life's a little different. Um, certainly um, beyond the farm gate, fierce competition. Even amongst breeders, fierce competition with one another to survive and prosper within this deregulated environment. So how are we going to get across the chain the sort of cooperation that we need to run a quality management system that gives us the returns that we used to get when Big Brother AWB ran it, because they took care of everything for us. They're no longer taking care of anything, so we have to sort this out for ourselves. Firstly, I guess, what does quality really mean? It's a function of several things. It's a function of genetics. It's a function of the production environment in which wheat is grown. It's a function of the season and the seasonal conditions that are inflicted upon our farms and over which they have no control. It's also a function of the storage and handling system and the processes that they engage in. And beyond that, it extends into distribution and processing. I don't think quality management stops until there's a product in a packet 
sealed, keep airtight, keeping out air, bugs and everything else that can affect product quality. So the quality focus starts right at the beginning of the chain and it doesn't end until we have a final product. So every sector of the chain has an intense focus on quality. The slightest compromise on quality can affect product performance, product price and ultimately what everybody in this industry makes out of their share of the chain. Quality is a very great determinant of price because it relates product to purpose. But having said that, we all know that supply and demand has a big impact on price as well. And we saw from some of um, Peter's graphs before with the increasing production by particularly the Ukraine and some of those areas of the world, that's bound to have an impact on price as their supply increases. I think there's always somewhere in the world that's short of wheat and somewhere else that's got more than they need. And so somehow every year it seems to all balance out somehow. But I'm sure that's not going to continue forever as some of these other new and emerging producers become much better at what they do. The advantage that we have over them at the moment is our quality system. But it's an advantage that we're clinging on to for dear life right now, I suggest. If we abandon the system, um, who knows what would happen. I don't think that's even an option. I can't imagine um, an industry without a quality management system of some sort. So let's start by having a look at what our competitors do. Every major wheat exporter in the world has some sort of wheat classification system, and I'll come back to classification in a minute. Um, although it says that the United States system is largely voluntary, in fact, domestically it is, but they have a very quick response time from their domestic market. Um, and at port, it's not. There are export regulations that are mandatory at port from the US, which effectively mean their classification system is mandatory. Australia, on the other hand, has no mandatory classification system. It is entirely voluntary. Whether or not you can sell your wheat if it's not classified and whether or not, if, even if you can, you get a price that is at all acceptable is quite another matter, but it is voluntary. At the moment, everyone cooperates because that's what we've always done. We're quite used to this system and no one else knows what they would do if they didn't do this. So, starting point is all of our competitors have classification systems of some sort. The Australian quality manage system management system spread out across the entire chain. Um, Wheat Quality Australia plays right at the beginning of the chain, which is, lost my red dot, there it is, right at this point here. What we, where we play is the genetics part of the spectrum. It's long term, it's high cost, it has an impact across the whole chain that is irreversible once it's in train. Um, we don't control anything beyond that point. What classification does basically is classify varieties of wheat. Sounds simple, but it's not very simple. Um, it's high science and I don't pretend to understand the first aspect of the high science and I don't think I'm alone in that. We do that by operating with firstly um, a council of industry participants called the Wheat Classification Council. The seats at that council are enshrined in our corporate constitution so that every sector is represented on the council. The role of the council is to bring market information, to monitor emerging trends and to bring them back into the organisation so that they can be communicated to breeders particularly and importantly to some people we employ who are called the variety classification panel. Is anyone in the audience from a variety classification panel? I can't see anyone. No, nowhere to go for help. These guys are the ones who have the sole responsibility for determining what varieties, what the samples the breeders submit are going to be classified as, what varieties they're going to be, in other words, what purpose this wheat is fit for. So these are huge decisions. The impact on these, of these decisions on the breeders and their breeding programs is absolutely significant. Um, breeding is a long-term uh, operation. It takes about 10 years to breed a new variety. Even if we had GM, which we don't, um, it would still take sort of eight to 10 years to breed a new variety. So the amount of money invested by breeding companies in varieties is significant. Like all research corporations, the breeders will have on the go at any one time many, many, many new varieties in development. But until they actually reach us, and until the variety classification panel um, 
considers what's been submitted and gives it a classification, the breeders can't actually be sure about what they're going to be able to market. So these are high impact decisions for both the breeders and particularly then the next stage for growers. Growers need to know what varieties can produce and in what conditions those varieties thrive so that they can make some decisions relating to their own production. There are not that many options, I think, for growers when trying to improve profitability on farm, but it starts for wheat farmers with the decision as to which varieties they're going to plant. So critical decisions also for growers about that. Um, some varieties are inherently worth more than others because of the markets to, into which they're sold and the products which they make. And again, supply and demand overlays all of that always in these marketplaces. From after the growers, um, the next stage of quality is the segregation that happens um, in storage and handling facilities and at, and at port before it goes to customers. And after that, it's out of our hands. But, it, but once wheat goes in the ground, um, the genetics are only part of the story. The next, um, the next important factors that affect the, um, the quality of the wheat are actually the production environment and the seasonal conditions. By the time the wheat is harvested and delivered to wherever it gets delivered to, silos, um, at that point, it's the seasonal conditions that are measured and the receival standards that most farmers uh, engage with, they actually reflect the seasonal conditions not, rather than the genetics themselves. So the two different factors playing out in the marketplace there. We've been asked, and we should have been asked a while ago, I guess, what value the classification system delivers for the Australian wheat industry. Nobody's asked that before, it seems to me. Um, in all our research, there has been a very small amount of work done on this, but basically um, none, not much. It was taken for granted again. It's what AWB did. AWB looked after it, and here we have an industry now without AWB to look after it. Um, finally, asking what value it adds. I might tell you that the budget for Wheat Quality Australia is somewhere around about a million dollars a year, which is about only 20% of what AWB used to invest in this function. And I might tell you also, you wouldn't be surprised to hear that our budget's a bit tight. Most people never say anything else about their budgets. But basically, we have a system that we inherited from AWB, we maintain it, which is about as good as we can do at the market, but there are a whole lot of questions need to be asked about the efficacy of this system, about its suitability in a deregulated environment, and what the Australian wheat industry really needs to compete, because the competition's getting tougher, not less intense. We started by commissioning a piece of economic modelling from the Centre for International Economics, and they came back to us and said, look, it looks like the classification system by itself adds something in the order of $228 million per annum to the industry across all sectors. That's not a very significant number in the context of the industry, but that's the baseline. It is the minimum amount that the industry benefits from, from having the system. The real value is probably significantly in excess of that. So we're now talking serious numbers for the industry. That equates to $12.02 per metric tonne annually, which I'm sure nobody would wish to um, sneeze at. Importantly, the benefits are shared along the chain. Um, they don't just go to one sector of the chain. I frequently hear criticism by one sector against another about where benefits lie in the chain, but I would suggest that a productive supply chain sees its benefits in every sector of the chain. They don't accrue to one sector. A supply chain where participants in one sector attempt to extract maximum value at the expense of other sectors can hardly be an efficient and productive supply chain. I prefer to think of it as um, growing the pie so that everybody benefits rather than seeing fierce competition to shift benefits from one sector to another. So there's not much agreement about this and the reason there's not much agreement is because nobody's ever asked the questions before so no one's ever tried to answer them. But the CIE work actually did show that um, growers, not surprisingly, benefit significantly. And the reason that they benefit significantly is because of the production decisions that it allows growers to make right at the base of the supply chain. No other part of the chain has the ability to do that. It's growers who make that decision. And the rest of the chain has to wear what growers decide to plant. Breeders obviously rely on this. They can't manage without a system that gives them 
market information about future trends so that they can develop and breed varieties to suit future uses. Um, without market information, they can't operate. They're breeding in the dark. Um, and the 10-year breeding cycle, you can imagine trying to predict what's going to happen 10 years from now. That's not easy. So the range of product that breeders actually need to have in their um, research bag lab um, to meet future anticipated market requirements 10 years from now is extensive. Even, I think, bulk handlers and traders benefit. Um, there's sometimes a sector of the chain that claims they benefit least. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. If I were an exporter or a bulk handler, I would know that I need to meet my customers' market requirements. Quality is demand-driven and it can't be anything else. It has to come from the final customer, the final consumer, ultimately, and be reverse engineered down the chain. So if bulk handlers and exporters don't have any way of explaining to their customers what they're putting in the bins or the containers or whatever it goes in to get to the customers, then the customers don't know what they're buying. And if the customers don't know what they're buying, then they won't buy it. So it seems to me pretty fundamental business premise that everybody at every part of this chain needs to quite clearly understand what's being bought and what's being sold. Um, the processing, um, the intense processing that wheat goes through to make the hundreds and hundreds of sorts of products that wheat gets turned into requires this. Bread, pasta, noodles all have different requirements and need different varieties of wheat to provide those requirements. It's not a homogeneous product. They're different products and they need a different um, growing base. So here we have benef the growers benefit the most. I still think that's arguable, actually. I see benefits along the whole supply chain. That's what our research told us. If we took away the classification system, what would we have? Um, I don't know how we could operate at all. But I think it's probably reasonable to say that if we removed the classification system that we currently have, an alternative system would develop. It would have to. It would have to develop so that it could meet market needs and, and um, reassure customers that, in fact, they're getting what they actually want and need to produce their products. So there would be value in an alternative system that developed. We didn't even begin to try to model that. One, um, probably cost a fortune. Two, there are probably so many algorithms in it, maybe Peter could explain them, that it's not even worth thinking about. Um, but it's quite clear that the alternative systems that develop would most likely be developed by sectors of the chain much closer to the customer than the growers are. They would most likely, in my mind, be systems that had some degree of commercial confidentiality about them, which means they become a bit of a black box. And um, you can bet your life that if there's a black box operating anywhere along the chain, then the growers won't know what's going on. So how can growers then make uh, justify the sorts of decisions they need to make about the varieties they want to grow, they would really be very much beholden to the sectors of the chain that controlled quality to tell them what to grow. That reduces growers' choice. It doesn't improve growers' choice. And it relates to what I said before about transfer costs across different sectors of the chain and whether there's any benefit in that. So out of all our research, we know that there is value of the existing system um, and the existing system could be much better, but for the minute there is value in doing it. Um, if we get $12.02 a tonne um, across every single tonne of Australian wheat, I think my CEO worked out what that costs, what we cost, which was seven cents, Robert? Where's Robert? Seven cents? We cost you seven cents a tonne. Um, I think that's a pretty good return for the industry, quite frankly. But I also think it's very important that these sorts of numbers have now been um, calculated, as simplistic as they are, the algorithms weren't. The opportunity for us, and when I listen to the challenges for productivity, I've heard a couple of times through the course of um, these sessions yesterday and today that productivity in grains uh, is declining, that we have extracted pretty much all we can extract from current science in improving um, productive capacity of our crop. That may or may not be wholly true, but I think the big gains, most of the scientists I talk to certainly agree that the big gains we have seen, and unless there's some technological breakthrough, we're not going to see any big productivity grains that are very obvious waiting out there to be grabbed. Lots of incremental things, but nothing significant in itself. 
that suggests to me that quality management is one of the few areas where productivity gains are to be obtained for the whole of the industry, not just for any one sector. Um, if we can maintain our international competitive advantage, and even for our local consumers, and there are significant local consumers of wheat within the country and processes um, who are chomping at the bit to have a piece of this pie as well, um, they're adamant that we can do it better, that there can be um, more rigorous systems of classification, there can be improved market focus. The system that we have needs to evolve, it needs to evolve technically and structurally. We need better information flow up and down the chain for everybody. I think growers are quite keen to have better information flow and I don't know that everyone else is quite keen that they have that. But as I said before, really efficient supply chains operate with a very high level of shared generic information. It enables everybody in the chain to make better decisions. It enables everybody in the chain to be more in control of their production and supply decisions. And ultimately that benefits the entire industry so that we get a bigger and better pie and not one that's constrained by internal competition along the chain that is more intense than it needs be. So Wheat Quality Australia right this minute remains responsible for classification services. We've got some actually major challenges, and some of those challenges relate to industry capacity. Um, our little variety classification panel, which has on it five or six serial chemists, we have a few more in training, but the pathway, the career pathways for serial chemists in Australia are not fantastic. Are there any serial chemists sitting in the audience? No, they can't tell you how not fantastic they are. Um, they're extremely limited. Um, and I know we keep talking about industry capacity as long as I've been associated with the grains industry. It's now serious. We have manufacturing businesses closing at a rate of knots. We've had several major food businesses close. Every time we lose a grain foods business, we lose capacity, we lose scientific capability, and we lose the base for research capability that underlies that. This is really serious for us as a nation. So we need to be able to work with industry to maintain that scientific capacity, to create pathways for the sorts of um, capability and technical expertise that we need to maintain the classification system and to translate that further along the chain so that we have an effective, reliable quality management system. Um, I think that's the only way Australia is going to be able to compete in the future. The challenges um, for Wheat Quality Australia for the future are significant. We still have argument along the chain about who benefits and, and the relationship between um, the benefit and the cost or the investment that needs to be made in Wheat Quality Australia. Those arguments are not finished by any means. This work that I've showed you here today has not been seen in public before. It has not been signed off by our board. It's brand spanking new. So you're the first people to see it. Um, I'd like to thank you for listening and I'm happy to take questions later. Thank you.